Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Triangle SQL Server Users Groups meeting today. We've got a bonus stream. Thankfully, uh, Jason Brimhall was able to work out a time where he could present to us on becoming intimate with your indexes. So without further ado, because I know that he's got some tight constraints today in terms of time, I'm going to hand it straight over to him to get going. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so today, as, as we announced, uh, we're going to be talking about indexes with SQL Server. Uh, and we have a few things that we're, we're going to try to dispel about indexes. Not only are we going to try to become more intimate with our indexes, but we're also going to be trying to understand use cases, how to optimize, where to remove, or where to alter, and, and largely just try to get some more information about them. Uh, so, uh, there we go. My slides weren't advancing. This is a little bit about me. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and skip through all the animations. Uh, as you can see, uh, I'm experienced with SQL Server a little bit. I've been doing it for a while. Uh, I do have a large family and that large family is just like many of you, kind of cooped up in their homes, thanks to COVID-19. Uh, so that's been a, a lot of fun. Uh, other than that time, I'm a Microsoft Certified Master and an MVP. You can see that I've, cut, I've got a couple of books out there where we do talk a little bit about indexes, but not quite to the depth that we hear. It, that's what I will show you today will be available. All right, first thing. Goals. We need to understand what an index is, understand the value of a good index, and then also try to become familiar with DMOs. Now, some of you might be wondering why we, why do we have this uh, Phoenix Summit AXUG you know slide deck up there. That's because I'm lazy. Uh, I adapted this uh, to present at the Dynamics Summit uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and a lot of these principles uh, came about because I was dealing with some rather large dynamics integrations. In fact, later on, I'll show you a use case built around uh, probably one of the largest dynamics AX integration uh, implementations throughout the world um, and some of the problems that they had and how it was such a good example to try to tune and become more familiar with the indexes. Uh, so. Uh, if any of you have been familiar with uh, Dynamics AX, you would understand that little graphic that's on the screen right there. Yes, it is a mind-dumbing experience, All right? This is where live presentation versus virtual presentation kind of becomes an issue. Uh, I like to play a fact or fiction. Uh, I've presented this a few times to so multiple places. The fact or fiction comes into this. I want you guys to be able to answer these questions. Unfortunately, I won't hear your answers, but I want you to think about these. This is coming from some documentation that I found concerning uh, Dynamics AX and SQL Server, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and it came from our friends at Microsoft. Uh, some of it might have been fixed since, but uh, first one, a table can have an unlimited number of indexes. Question is true or false? Let you think about that for a spell. And we got our first answer of fiction with an extra point. <laughs> Even though it's in Microsoft documentation, it is absolute fiction. All right, we'll talk about the, what the actual limitation is there uh, a little bit later, but basically, uh, uh, roughly a thousand indexes, one clustered index, one 999 uh, non-clustered indexes, plus you have some other various indexes you could add, All right? Tables have at most a few indexes enabled. Jeopardy music, be popping in the background. The background. <laughs> yeah, there there is a little bit of a stream delay. It's about 10, 15 seconds, so. <laughs> Uh, the, the answer is, huh? <laughs> that is that is a good answer. Um, I don't understand how that one 
makes sense because um, yes, tables can have a few indexes enabled. And yes, tables can have a thousand indexes enabled. <laughs> it's it's not unlimited number of indexes. It, it, it's just not, it, it doesn't make sense. I don't know why that was there. Okay. When an index is disabled, it is deleted from the database. Yeah, I'll wait for the, uh, the uh, five second television delay. Nope. <laughs> Correct. That is a matter of fiction. Index is disabled. The index is not deleted from the database, though the pages for the index are deallocated. The index uh, definition still exists, and all you have to do is just rebuild it in order for it to become functional again. All right. And <laughs> this is my favorite. Indexes are managed automatically by the DBMS. <laughs> Anybody laughing yet? <laughs> the fact on that one is that, well, the, the answer to that one, I don't want to mis, misconstrue it there. The answer to that is that's a total piece of malarkey. Um, there is some management by the DBMS, like, uh, you know, when an index gets fragmented, <laughs> when an index uh, becomes corrupt, you know, I can't say corrupted, uh, you know, or when stats get updated, uh, that is automatically and stats are tightly coupled to indexes and they're a special type of index. So, index is managed automatically by the DBMS. No, uh, index is becoming defragged, and that's not managed by the DBMS. When to create an index? Not at all by the DBMS. When you have duplicate indexes and you need to merge them? <laughs> not a chance. So that's that's kind of a a misnomer there. However, there you know we still have some various you know things coming out where you can enable automatic, you know, uh, uh, automatic maintenance on this, where occasionally in Azure DB, for instance, an index may be automatically created. Um, so that's not, that's not fully fiction, I guess, and not fully fact, but when this was taken, yes, it was fully, fully fiction. All right, now to the juicy stuff, our case study. So, uh, this is this is going to be a little bit weird for people unless they're familiar with Dynamics AX, but Dynamics AX kind of does a weird thing inside of the database where they can partition uh, the data in multiple different ways, and it's not true data partitioning. What it is is it's row-based partitioning, and the way that happens is, you know, okay, this is company type one, this is company two, company three. Those are considered uh, basically you know, basically partitions and then inside of each of those companies, they can have the same type of thing. And then based off of those two GUIDs, now you have your, your neat, unique entry and it's row-based. Um, it's, it's far different than partitioning as we would think from a database administration standpoint. All right, so in this case, we had just one company in the entire database. Uh, it's not a traditional are not like some implementations where you might have three companies and a couple of partitions. All right, uh, significantly slow, and we're talking about you know trying to you know, query for inventory items and it taking thirty seconds or more. All right, this is where the complexity comes into place. Uh, the warehouse locations. Uh, were rather significant, 120 warehouse locations located all throughout the U.S. And a warehouse is where any inventory could actually be stored. And the way AX works is anytime you pick up, a, pick up a piece of inventory and you move it to a different shelf, even if it's on the same rack, moving it to a different shelf that has to be recorded in the database as a warehouse movement. That way everything is tracked and inventory properly. Now, 120 warehouses is a little bit steep. Most places only have, you know, 
four or five tops and legitimately, you know, one one warehouse. Uh, the quantity of warehouses makes this uh, made this a, a rather steep issue. The database uh, at the time that I finished my work with it and trying to get things tuned up uh, was two terabytes, but when I started, it was three terabytes. And through some of the various work that I did with indexes, we were actually re able to reclaim over a terabyte of space. Um, obviously, that's going to come through some some fun little tools. You know, some of your guessing guessing right away. Uh, that's got to be compression. Uh, very close. All right. 53 million inventory variants. Um, that's an absurd number of inventory SKUs to have in a database, uh, quite frankly. I mean, we're talking Amazon numbers with that. Uh, Amazon, Walmart, you know, all of our big uh, vendors like that. Uh, this this particular company was a a sports gear type of shop and they had 53 million inventory variants. Uh, and one of the issues that they had with that is not only did they have the current inventory, but also all the historic inventory. So, and because of the way uh, AX works, you end up with application cursors that would cycle through all of those variants and then lots of tail scans. Um, and just a lot of general slowness uh, because we had so much. And what we were currently experiencing, about 1 million transactions a second. Um, so we were trying to support this well, we're trying to maintain the performance. Any sort of a, a misstep would be quickly noticed by the application because a 30 second query would turn into a three minute query. Um, so we had to be very careful as we proceeded. Big stuff. Um, oh, and I wanted to point out a few more things that were kind of kind of important. Uh, all storage on the server for this particular client was Fusion IO. Uh, we were running at about nine hundred thousand. Nine, excuse me. Uh, 900 million IOPS a second. Um, so uh, storage was not an issue. Uh, memory, memory was not an issue. Server resources were not an issue. Database design and maintenance absolutely was. All right. Okay. Now that we've got all of that in, in, in the play, now let's dial it back a step and try to look at some of the basics related to indexes. Some of the basics, and I included in green over there on, on my right hand side, uh, the AOT. AOT is Dynamics AX way of managing indexes. And it's a really poor design, but anytime you wanted to, in theory, manage indexes, the indexes had to be deployed just like code into the AOT, otherwise those indexes ran the risk of being deleted. Uh, that's according to AX best practices. Uh, now I'm gonna flip flop that and say, I say bollocks and I've got processes to better manage the indexes uh, that do not require the use of the, uh, deploying the indexes to via code to the AOT and allows you to be a better DBA, frankly. Uh, so some of our uh, options for looking and getting familiar with indexes. Uh, from a DMO perspective, we have SysDMDB partition stats. And it, it, very, very careful about that. That is DMO and not GMO, and thus non-GMO. We are fully dynamic management objects and not the GMO stuff. All right, so DMDB index physical stats. So that's one of those jokes where it's better in person. DMDB index usage stats and DMDB index operational stats. And those will give us uh, kind of a live view of the indexes as, as their, and, and their current stats. And there are some small caveats to that. Uh, various different service packs had different effects on these. Um, 
sometimes uh, some of these would get cleared out. Uh, those have been fixed with later service packs. So we should be good now. Uh, if you're on, if you're running latest service packs, and hopefully you're not on something I don't know, like SQL Server 2008 R2 uh, RTM, which I'm trying to get another client fixed off of right now. Non-DML, on the other hand, is things that are not your that that do not fall into the DM underscore type of thing. And I say DMO because not all of those objects are views. You know, so a lot of people say, hey, they're in the DMV as well. Sometimes we say DMV when we're talking about a function. Well, the function is not a, DM is not a DMV. It's a DMF. If you say DMO, now you've got both, co have both covered because it's an object. All functions and views are objects. Uh, so the non-DMO ones are anything that's not have prefaced by DM underscore. The one that still gives me a little bit of consternation is that very bottom one that's down in the blue that says sys.sysindex keys. Um, this day and age, we really shouldn't be using it, but every once in a while, it does have some handy information. And we're talking about something that came from the Windows 2, or excuse me, the SQL Server 2000 days. And things have been restructured quite a bit since then. So moving on, what is an index? Now all of you are smart, as I understand, and that is looking extremely fuzzy on this, but basically an index, if you're familiar with, with a book, uh, it serves the same purpose as what would do, happen inside of a book as what would happen inside a SQL Server. You have a listing of toppings at, at, <laughs> toppings, <laughs> topics at the end of the book that will allow you to go and look up specific pages where that topic might actually surface inside of the database or inside of the book. Same is true of a database. I have created this index. This index goes and records each of the page numbers where that topic or that word or that value exists and says, okay, this is basically the pointer for that one, anytime you want to search for this value, I'm just going to go down the tree. I'm going to peruse my path until I get to the right tree, uh, down, the, uh, down to the right page, and then I'm going to have that value. Uh, similar topic, similar idea when you're talking about a range of values. Uh, okay, I've got the first value in the range. It starts at this page, and the last value in this range, it, start, it ends at this page. Okay, now I'm going to go and retrieve all those pages. Same thing you do in kind of a book. Uh, book index. Sometimes when you look inside of a book, it'll tell you that, say, you wanted to look up uh, wingdings for a bicycle. It will tell you pages 547 through 560. Well, that, that, that might be an entire subsection of a chapter that specifically talks about wingdings. And that's what an index inside a SQL Server on a basic level does for you. Sorry, I had to, I have somebody trying to call me, so I had to de decline it. Okay, here's a little bit clearer image about that index and the same sort of uh, principles, just a little bit easier to view. As you can see right there, you have animated cartoons. It says, hey, I can find animated cartoons if you look on the right-hand side, second line down. It says animated cartoons, pages 21 through 24. Uh, that's your range scan, all right? All right. Now, earlier I alluded to indexes and stats being very similar. All right? They're very tightly coupled. So now we're going to talk about a little bit of that. Uh, the fundamentals from an index perspective and from a stats perspective. Two basic types, right, of indexes. You have clustered and non-clustered. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you have one clustered index per table. 999 non-clustered indexes per table. And a caveat to that. How can I get more than one clustered index on a table? There's a few different ways these days. Prior to some of the newest technology, uh, we could trick SQL Server by creating a an indexed view with 
and thus we would end up with multiple clustered indexes on a table uh, because by you know because the clustered index is created on the view and then it's propagated down to the to the tables as well okay so that's that's one trick we could also do say a clustered xml index and we can also do a clustered column store index so that adds a little bit of variety now to to this but when we're talking your traditional indexes without doing some trickery one clustered index per table all right uniqueness sometimes constraints can be import enforced via an index is every is every clustered index a unique index yes and no it doesn't necessarily mean that the data on that clustered index is is unique but what happens if it's not unique is a unique qualifier is added to it is every primary key mandatorily you know and primary keys are all unique is a primary key always a clustered index the same answer it, no the default behavior is to create a clustered index on a primary key and so uh, you know, is it always the best you know, best key for your clustered index? No, that's where a little bit of thought comes into play. That's why we say uniqueness. Sometimes constraints can be enforced to be in an index. It's not always the case, and it's not always mandatory that the index A B be uh, unique. But you can also add the unique uh, the unique attribute to to an index. All right main purpose of an index is to help with data lookup. You know, kind of like what we saw with the with the book examples, an index helps you to discover where data resides in the various pages throughout the book or slash database, All right? When we're talking SQL Server, indexes are structured in a B dash tree um, or B minus tree. Uh, which is a little bit different than some of the other structures. Uh, Oracle does, if I recall correctly, a B plus tree. Uh, and what the B tree, whether it's a plus or a minus, really indicates is more or less the, uh, the shape of the tree, all right? You'll have a, a single root page, zero more intermediate levels, and then a leaf level, and your leaf level can have a lot, a lot of pages. Each page, is an AK chunk. Uh, you have a header and a footer that's a part of that AK chunk. And then each page will have a file ID and a page number. And this helps with the lookup numbers. Uh, thanks to Gail Shaw with that. Um, that came from her book. So this is kind of what the structure of a B tree looks like. All right. So you have your, your leaf nodes on the right hand side, and you have your, your branch node. And as you peruse further up the tree and you get further up to the root, then you have fewer and fewer pages, right? Now we come to a special index. And hopefully it's not too, too special these days, but it's a different methodology altogether, right? And this is the BW tree, all right? And BW trees exist with in-memory OLTP aka hackathon and they are used for uh in quite a bit of a different way right where these are going to be kind of out of scope for for most of today uh mostly because i haven't built it into the scripts yet all right that said bonus question is what does bw stand for We got guesses coming in now. Uh, not yet. We're gonna we're gonna see if anybody's willing to hazard a guess on this one. <laughs> I believe it's Buffalo Wild Wings. Ooh, I like that. Wax. But that would be Buffalo Wild Wings would be B Dubs. That's true. Right? <laughs> Making me hungry. <laughs> All right. The official answer is no clue. And that, that's hey, I like that answer. 
Okay. Um, important thing about a BW tree, it is lock and latch free indexing. That's why the structure is a little bit different. And should have the answer now. BW just stands for buzzword. <laughs> that makes me angry. <laughs> BWW is coming next. That way we can have Buffalo Wild Wings. Um, yeah, it was just kind of an internal joke at Microsoft. And, you know, so BW stuck. And you're going to have a hard time actually finding buzzword in the official documentation until you talk to the right people. <laughs> like Kale and Delaney. <laughs> All right. In memory, this is this is uh, something that gave me a lot of consternation when dealing with AX. AX uh, proclaims that SQL Server can only do an in-memory structure for up to 128K. Now, that would be pointless in using, quite frankly. <laughs> I mean, there's just, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, the reality is SQL Server can do a heck of a lot more than 128K. There are limitations around your bucketizers and your, your, your definitions, your, your, your design of the in-memory objects, uh, as well as how much available server, server memory you have, right? But you can do considerably more than 128K. I mean, that's, that's going back to... I don't know, I want to say 1995 days. Stats, okay. You guys are probably reading this already, but think about it. Have you ever realized that whenever you're looking at um, your index IDs, how that index ID will also have the same stats ID, okay? Secondly, when you create additional stats on a table, for instance, let's say you have, let's, let's back it up a little bit on the scenario. I create a clustered index and then I create three statistics on a table and then I decide to create another index. Uh, that kind of a situation. Have you ever done that and taken a look at what your index ID would be for that second index? Now, obviously, your clustered index is going to be index ID one, right? And because you have you create a second index, you would think, oh, hey, now that should be index ID two, right? That's wrong, right? Stat two, three, and four will get index ID two, three, and four, and then the second index will get index ID five. And that's because of the tight coupling between stats and indexes. Uh, and the fact that uh, statistics are a special kind of index, all right? Now, as you see up there, every index will have a corresponding statistics created with it, but not every statistics will have a corresponding index, all right? And that's, you know, that's why we kind of have to manage indexes and stats separately is because while they are tightly coupled, it does not, it is not mandatory for a statistic to be an index. And there are cases where performance will be better with it as a statistic versus an index. And then there's a tipping point, you've probably heard that, where the index must be converted, or excuse me, where the stats will gain better performance by being converted to an index. So things to take into consideration when deciding to convert one to the other is the fact that stats do not add to your storage requirements Rather, they contain a lot of your, your histograms and your steps related to where the data is allocated, very similarly to an index and how an index stores the pages, all right? So would it be valuable to take a 170 gig table that has a decent enough performing stat on it and take, say, three columns and convert it the, the stats on it and convert it to an index. And maybe this, the index for best performance would need to have three columns on it. And now you're going to need to have, say, an additional 10 gigs of storage to store that index. Would it be worth it? Some companies, it would be too much cost. Some companies, it's like, do it right now, right? 
So that's, that's some of the considerations. There are costs, indexes and stats. Indexes are not free, stats are mostly free. All right. This is where we want to get into the deep dive into our indexes. Uh, and uh, we may not have time for stats because there's a lot on the indexes and the stats will be kind of in a, would typically come after all the indexes since I grouped them together. So now how to, let me get out of presentation mode. And I'll share my uh, management studio first. And hopefully you guys are seeing that now. Uh, this is. Yep. It's this is. Sorry, I'm just going to okay. keep cutting you off. Uh, actually, <laughs> one quick thing. Could you bump up the font size just a little bit more? Okay, we'll go up one more level. Is that good? Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, as you can see here, that's you're going to be scrolling through just a lot of code, right? And this this is the the grand pumba of the uh, index presentation. But before we dive into that. I have a demo of it, uh, trying to get back some live stats from a client system right now for you. Uh, I'm just gonna go through and show some of the scripts related to the actual, uh, uh, some of the things that I've done to help various clients with their indexes. And this happens to be one of them. This is the index analysis deep dive, all right. Uh, okay. And I want to do this right here. It's the uh, index audit. Okay, so in the case of AOT or Dynamics AX clients, what I have done for them so that we do not have to manage it with the AOT is I allow them to go ahead and create their indexes on, directly inside a SQL Server. And along with that, what I've done is deployed a system that will basically audit their indexes. And since having done that, I would revise this a little bit to use extended events where possible because extended events will show me all of the index changes, whether I create an index, alter the index or, or drop an index. So I would know right away and I could just pull those straight out of there. And it's a, it, it's a lot more streamlined. Uh, so that's that's version two for this uh, where possible, okay? But we have a, a series of tables and it's all job based DBA index def change. So I've, I'm recording the definition for all of the indexes. I'm going to go or excuse me when the index definition changes. I also have a table that actually records what their definitions is with a date stamp. And we also version each index each time it's changed. We, I staged the data before we actually put it into the index definitions table. This is helping, this will help me to determine back up here in the defs change table if the if there's a difference between stage and prod. All right. And then I have some code down here near the bottom that I could put into a job that will allow me to run it just before they do a code promo uh, with their AX product. I can just go ahead and run this job. It'll pull in all of their index definitions. And then I also have this run nightly at midnight. That way anything else that is, if that is captured during that time, I will have a log of those indexes as they existed at mid midnight. You do a code, a code promotion, say at 9 p.m. At 8.55, we run this. We get all the index definitions right before the code promo. After the code promo, we run the ex hit this, this audit process yet again. And then I compare those two exact runs. As a fail safe, 
if I if they happen to do one without running the if they happen to do a code promo without having run the index audits prior to the code promo, we still have the midnight run of the index audits and we can compare post run to and to prior uh, to uh, the midnight run, which will give us okay. Uh, AX decided to go ahead and drop uh, 17 indexes. And as it turns out, maybe uh, 13 of those indexes were actually indexes managed by the AOT as well. Okay, you can actually query them in the AOT and you can still see them there. So we just put them back, right? Because they got dropped from SQL Server. Um, so that, that, that is why this is here, is to help those clients. Uh, and, and to summarize the why, is because the AOT does not actually properly log uh, those changes. And if I go back into the index analysis, um, actually have a section dedicated to that. Put out here. I only run this section if you're a Dynamics AX DB. Otherwise, we re report everything and we report out. Uh, that it's, it's not applicable, all right? So during this, I go and gather all of the definitions that are in the AOT, and I compare them to what we have on disk, or excuse me, on SQL Server, and I can tell you whether an AOT index exists in SQL Server, or, or vice versa, or where they exist in both, but they have differences, and as, luck i guess we want to call it would have it there are a lot of cases where the aot is just flat out wrong it does not contain either the index or the index is created with the same name in the aot but it has a different definition uh largely usually the index definition is uh the key order is incorrect according to the aot so do i want to rely on something like that or do i want to rely on something like sql server to help manage my indexes uh, unanimously the decision should be i'm going to go with sql server because the aot is wrong all right so that's that's a quick synopsis i mean this as i was telling kevin right before we started uh he he looked over here at my sidebar uh, my scroll bar excuse me and saw that it was a very long uh, query uh, if we go and look at it through to the very end it is a lot of data um, it is roughly 5,000 lines of code, uh, and it's still getting added to because there's more deep dives into indexes that I keep on adding some more, some more caveats that I'd like to pull out and be able to understand that information. Okay. Now let's go ahead and switch over to the live, uh, the live results. Hopefully they're finished by now. Uh, coming back. Oh, that's that's a first. <laughs> all right, so we have a lot of results. We're going to have, uh, can you give me all the results that I wanted? Something happened in this production copy of this database that did not happen in dev. That's fine. I'll change it up. That means I got to go troubleshoot something a little bit later. Why there's a uh, drift between the databases and what it is exactly in the production that is causing the script to fail at a place that has never failed before. All right. We love demo files. Make sure I'm on the right server. 
I'm going to change my connection here. Yeah, just a minute. Come on, I need my dose up. I was not connecting. Okay. Something I gotta go fix with that one. I know it worked with this because I've already run it in the past. Well, I'll be. Well, let's, I'm not going to get you the results because. It's failing everywhere, and I have not changed that line of code. So I got to go figure out what's going on with it. So that would be a different time. Uh, all right. So we'll just, we're going to go back to rather than demoing this, um, with the massive fail that it is. We'll go back to just talking about the code. Okay, we'll go through them section by section. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and skip the obvious what this section is doing, and that is just setting up all my temp tables. And as you can see, um, yeah, I use a lot of them. Um, that way I can regather information without querying the DMVs multiple times uh, and try to save myself just a little bit of uh, pain. All right. Uh, this section right here is for when we're processing the Dynamics AX, and I just talked about that just a moment ago where we're trying to go ahead and gather information about uh, specifically what's in the AOT and compare what's in the AOT versus what's in SQL Server index definitions, right? Okay, next we're gonna go ahead and gather all the index definitions. That's not going to be terribly uh, big there. Open it there. Okay. This is kind of a big one right here. This one took a little bit of time. Processing compression savings estimates uh, for each database. Now, as we're working through the compression savings, we want to understand what the compression to what which type of compression is going to be best suitable for a specific table and the range of compression that you can have 
as you can see on that on that screen right there is none row page column store or column store archive now the this section it's a rather it's a decent sized section has a little bit of logic built into it to determine you know, what what kind of compression is already existing what are the various uh, data types that are in each of the columns on that table it, it and how will that affect compression and then what version of SQL Server are you running? Because uh, version of SQL Server also impacts the way that you can A, build a column store, or B, uh, alter an index, uh, or whether you can have multiple indexes that are on the same table as, say, a column store. So that, that does come into play, and also the column store archive. Uh, comes into play a little bit as well because uh, not until 2019, I believe, was it um, measured in some of the uh, system uh, system objects, right? Even though column store archive was available sooner, all right? Okay, so we're gathering that information. Then we're gonna go ahead and go to the next session. Uh, now I wanna go and also process tree and leaf information for each database for the database, for each table, for each index in each table in the database. Uh, uh, also, I'm outputting various different start times so I can gauge where exactly in the process it failed, which is what I'm gonna do after we're done with this call. All right. Uh, leaf information is kind of important because uh, sometimes in your indexes, you're going to have uh, quote unquote hidden columns that are a part of your index. Um, uh, an easy example of this would be when you're when you build an index and there's a clustered index built on the table, the key columns from your clustered index are also added to your non-clustered index. Right? Sometimes you have a hidden unique liquifier column added to that to the leaf level on your on your index, uh, on your non-clustered index. So you may want to understand that, that where those are coming into play. Where those hidden columns are, and what the what the leaf columns are, and what the key columns are. All right, uh, fragmentation estimates. Everybody loves to understand where fragmentation is at in their database, uh, with the exception of a few people out there where uh, they vehemently believe that index fragmentation doesn't matter. Um, I've seen where 5% fragmentation can make a difference of two seconds in a query. Uh, and you're like, oh, what, what difference does that make? Well, if I'm trying to maintain a million transactions per second, it matters, right? You know, we're talking about heavy duty workloads. So fragmentation will matter. And especially when you're dealing with any of the uh, Microsoft type of databases, talking about, you know, SharePoint, the entire dynamic suite and that includes uh, nav ax uh, great plains and so forth uh, crm crm is is really bad about fragmentation so you want to have that up you want to understand where that fragmentation is all right weights and operational stats do i have an index that's a little bit piggy and 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 taking a little bit long is it caused because we have too many lookups going and to try to fetch blob data or blob data? Uh, I want to understand where that's coming from. Um, aggressive indexes. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the results set here. We're talking about aggressive indexes are going to be any of these that have uh, aggressive page locks or aggressive. Or, uh, I just said aggressive again. Any that have a high value for page locks or a high value for row locks, right? Page locks and row locks can indicate that you maybe have an index that's taking too many of your lock resources and something may need to be done with that index or the queries that are using that index. Okay, so we call these piggy indexes. All right, uh, next up, uh, similar in nature, lock hoarding indexes. All right, um, and this is one where I threw this in as a fix for a 
a, a specific uh, use case where I've come across various DBAs have decided that they're going to go out there and disable page locking altogether in all databases in their uh, database real estate. Um, there's a reason that page locks are enabled by default. And it's the better locking option. And to blanket disable page locking is a bad idea. Disabling page locking on an individual index is not necessarily a bad thing, but it is something that has to be taken with extreme care and prejudice uh, because generally speaking, we want to allow page locking, right? So there are some edge cases where you want to disable it, but that should be very, very judiciously uh, undertaken. Okay, duplicate indexes. Now, what's wrong with a duplicate index? Hey, if, if I have two indexes, that means it is performing twice as good, right? If I have three, then it's three times faster because I've got three indexes working for me, right? No, that's not true. Uh, use case around this one, uh, a very fun one was had an, uh, a DBA who went out and created duplicate indexes. Uh, one, he called it the right index to help optimize writes. And the other one, he created it as the read index to help optimize reads. Um, I hope a lot of you just did a face palm type of thing because that is asinine behavior. Um, when we have duplicate indexes, you are looking at increased maintenance and overhead on your system. Every time that page, that value has to be changed on a page, it has to be changed for multiple indexes. So if I have three indexes that are exactly the same, well, I've got to go to index one, make that change, which locks index two and three. Then I have to go to index two, make that change. It locks index one and index three as well. And then I've got to do it for index three. You want to talk about a way to slow down your database? That's the way to do it, All right? Add write indexes and read indexes with the same definitions. Go ahead, keep on shaking your heads, it's fine. Okay, here's another one that, uh, this is one of the first things that I added into this, and that is to help process missing foreign key indexes. Now, most cases, foreign keys do not have indexes on them. An index does not get created on a foreign key by default at all, ever. You have to do it manually. Why do we want an index on a foreign key? Well, it, it actually helps in the lookup and, the, and in the joins. Uh, in addition, as a side note, you also want to make sure that your foreign keys are trusted. Because if your foreign key is trusted, you know what routinely happens? Well, SQL Server says, oh, that data is trusted. We know it. So we don't have to go out and touch that table unless we have to retrieve a specific piece of information from it. So it simplifies the query, reduces the cost, and improves performance when your keys are trusted. Okay, even if if SQL Server has to go and fetch data, then I have that that foreign key indexed on the destination to, on the child table, and I can go and fetch that table in a much quicker form. Okay, and it is useful to have indexes on your foreign keys. Problematic objects for the for your database. Okay. Now this is kind of a difficult one. These are these are objects where I am looking at um, uh, sorry, cut out a little bit. Uh, I am looking for specific indexes that might be on objects that really are not user tables. Okay. Wait, can we have indexes on on something that is not a table? Yes, I, besides the obvious that I mentioned earlier, which is an index to view, there is uh, something else that pops up and that is called functions. Your scalar functions, your UDFs, um, uh, multi-table variable functions, inline table variable functions, uh, 
they all have indexes that are created behind the scenes for them. Okay, this will help you if you're not if you're not aware of maybe some of those by adding this query in here. I can see, oh, hey, basically this is created this 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 function kind of creates a pseudo table in the background, uh, and I need to be aware of it. Everybody is probably well aware that functions can be a rather detrimental, as well as a very useful thing to performance in your database. A poorly written one could uh, could take away very many seconds of, of performance. So you want to be aware of them so that you can go tune them. And this just helps bring that awareness to the forefront. Uh, and then at the end of it, uh, because of various things that are related to uh, uh, some of the DM, uh, DMOs that I access, uh, any databases that are offline will actually impact processing and the it will actually cause it to throw an error. So I want to put the databases online just for the for a short duration and then I turn the database back offline so that those functions will work. And this is just a way of tracking that. Okay. So that's kind of it in a nutshell with a very uh, poorly executed uh, demo there. I apologize for that fail. Uh, I'll get that fixed for the next time. Uh, but are there any questions? We've got about four minutes. We're going to see if there are questions. This is normally where I would vamp, but it turns out I'm not very good at it. I think the answer is no questions at the moment. OK. Um, quiet on the chat side, relatively, other than the questions I asked? Pretty much. OK. Well, I appreciate your guys' time. Uh, let me go ahead and switch back to the uh, slides real quick. I just got a couple of closing comment slides. Oops. Okay. So, uh, in case you're interested, uh, minus the uh, Google Plus there, because that doesn't exist anymore. I need to remove that from the slide. That's just in my template. Um, there is basically my, my contact information. Uh, what I do want to add to there is um, a couple more sites. Uh, one of them being SQL BP, as in SQL Best Practices .com. Uh, I am. Uh, you guys may be aware, Robert Davis used to be the owner of that. I uh, used to manage that. I've gotten the, I resurrected the sites last year. Uh, and now we're trying to bring them up, uh, not bring them up, but uh, help to elevate some of the content in there and refresh the content. Uh, so keep an eye on that. Uh, and also, you want to keep an eye on, uh, you know, just continue to use SQLSoldier.com because that one's also uh, alive and well. Uh, it's just basically all the all of Robert's uh, blog posts, uh, articles he has gotten out there and they are in a uh, in an archival state now. So I appreciate your time and thanks for having me. Having me. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, joining us today. One quick question. Is the code available anywhere? Uh, I can, if people will send me an email at uh, jason.brimhall at databasemasters.com. Uh, excuse me. Let me uh, let me uh, chat that to you so you can actually share it to them correctly.
to go. Um, I can I can send it out to individual people. I I have not published this anywhere. Uh, fair enough. So I'll. And I obviously have something I need to go fix right now as well. There we go. That should be showing for people. Great. So I know we're at the top of the hour and you have a hard stop. So I definitely appreciate your time today. Uh, you may have a few people reach out to you for the code. As always, everybody, we'll see you on the next stream. So thanks to Jason for his time. Thank you, everybody in chat, for your time. And everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye.